was a crisis. Can you just take us through some of the, tr the, the, the activity that we saw with office buildings uh, in the past two years? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think uh, a lot of references made for the last two years in terms of uh, where we've gotten a lot of vacancies and, and a lot of opportunity around taking office buildings and converting them into residential. Good evening and welcome to episode 447 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. It's the Wednesday edition of the Private Property Podcast. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the family. You're tuned in to the leading podcast in all things property in South Africa. Letting us know if you're joining us for the first time, we absolutely love showing uh, new members of the family some love. Now, this conversation uh, that we're having this evening is one that I know a lot of the property entrepreneurs in particular uh, are very interested in. We love seeing the different opportunities that are in the market and really exploring the different ways that we can take advantage of them as much as possible. We're looking at unused office, build, office buildings. You know, what are some of the latest trends? What are uh, some of the opportunities that are there because of, you know, the unused office buildings that we see due to uh, a a lot of us working from home or adopting some kind of hybrid model and to help us get a sense of what some of the opportunities are and what you could potentially um, certainly explore and what you should look out for if you want to go down that route. I'm joined this evening by Grant Smear, who's a CEO at Frankie Bell's Real Estate. Grant, good evening and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, so, Grant, it seems every time I, ha I, I, I have, have you on the show, you have a different designation. Uh, there's always new kinds of business that you are conquering. I think, tell us a little bit about that, because I know the listeners are like, mm, but we know him as this, we know him as that. But I, I, I mean, I keep up with, you know, the various activities and the expansion of, of the business and the work that you do. Just share with us and our viewers at home just a, just a bit on, on why we keep having you with different designations, because I'm sure by now they're like, but we know this guy. Uh, but the last time he was here, th that's that's not the company he was uh, certainly representing. Yeah, thanks, Anna. And so, so I am um, essentially a property entrepreneur focused on the professional services of property. Uh, at, at core, I'm a property investor, so I started out uh, ABC property myself. And then I did find that as an entrepreneur, there's opportunities in the property market to um, sort of expand into the services space. So. I am a franchise law of any realty, a national real estate uh, agency. Um, Frankie Bells has joined that stable and is um, a realty Frankie Bells actually. Um, and we also have uh, Belmont's uh, property management which is a sexual title management company. So it's just really taking my experience as, a, as an investor and as an owner, uh, as a property owner, and trying to uh, create the services and professional service company around what I would expect um, as an investor and an owner in, in the properties uh, from a services point of view, from a, a pricing point of view. And, and really just um, trying to improve the, the industry um, through uh, either being involved actively or, or having these talks and speaking. Mm. I think if anything, Grant, it, you know, it's testimony to how when you're a property entrepreneur, you find the different opportunities within the uh, broader property spectrum. And this is across whether you, you know, doing property management, you're doing uh, sectional title management. Uh, you and I know the different kinds of opportunities, the use of, you know, tech, you look at prop tech, uh, you know, innovations and finding different ways of uh, integrating them in the businesses in the different businesses that you're running. Uh, I think it's, it really is testimony to how the dots are the way of connecting. And I think when you are in the space and in the value chain, you're able to see the different opportunities uh, along the value chain, which probably brings me, of course, to the, the exact conversation that we're having this evening, because we've seen some of the um, you know, different opportunities uh, when we talk about you know, breathing fresh life into the unused office buildings that we are finding. I think first, if we look at the, the stage of office buildings, particularly from you know 
it's nearly two years to the date uh, when you know President Ramaphosa uh, announced that we're going to be going into 21 days of lockdown. And of course, when we look at what has happened to the office space, particularly in the major metros in the past two years, it has on the one side not a, not a, has not been the greatest story for uh, you know some of the landlords, but of course also has created great opportunities uh, for those who are able to tap into uh, what effectively was a crisis. Can you just take us through some of the tr the, the the activity that we saw with office buildings uh, in the past two years? That's yeah, so, so, I mean, I think uh, a lot of references made for the last two years in terms of uh, where we've gone, a lot of vacancies and, and a lot of opportunity around taking office buildings and convert them into residential. But what I was seeing, and I've seen it in Cape Town early on, is, is probably three, four years ago, where we were having conversations with some of the funds and some of the big um, property owners there, where they started see, seeing vacancies in, in increasing and want to make better use of their property. So they started looking at uh, converting um, uh, office blocks into, re into residential. And I think what really happened was, again, the pandemic, just like the, uh, sort of the digital revolution that's happened over the last two years, is the pandemic and, and the lockdowns just accelerated uh, a reality for large office blocks and large office spaces into space where people or landlords and, and property owners were realizing let's make better use of those spaces because it's no longer viable for companies um, as digital was, was gaining traction to take massive amounts of space. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just been an acceleration of a, of a process that I think was coming uh, anyway. Um, and those guys that were, were sort of looking at it as an option obviously jumped on that space pretty quickly and have created some quite exciting projects. Mm -mm. And I think talking about some of those exciting projects, we've seen different players coming into the mix. Uh, you know, some of the big players, your growth points, uh, your sets of property fund, your black bricks hotels, trying to take advantage, of course, of uh, the the opportunity that these uh, vacant spaces uh, has effectively created. I think broadly speaking, I mean, talk us through when you are particularly a big player. I think before we look at the, 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 the guys who are still in the relatively early stages of their entrepreneurship journey or don't have the capital when you're a big player and assessing different kinds of opportunities especially like these to take advantage of uh, and to potentially make a move what are some of the drivers that you're looking for that help you in making that decision and whether of course to acquire that particular uh, office building and and potentially convert it of course uh, into uh, perhaps a, a residential or a mixed-use uh, space so, you know, so I, don't, I don't think if you look at the big players, we're not really looking at acquisition. We're looking at properties that are they already owned, that are underperforming, that are sitting with high vacancies, that are sort of almost sore thumbs in their portfolios. And the problem again is, is you come into a space where these properties have high vacancies, um, aren't performing, and now they need to sell them. So they're not going to achieve the value that they necessarily need to or may have paid for those or invested into those properties over the years. So, so they need to sit in them and, and, and make them um, uh, provide a return and create value so that they can be sold out of the fund if they need to. So I think um, really it was a necessity out of poor performance that the funds and uh, the big guys came at this. And when they saw the model started working, uh, particularly again, you mentioned BlackRick, I'm a huge fan of, of their work. Um, when you see, start seeing it working, that's when they went up and took the model and, and then replicated. So I think it, it came from necessity and it led into creating an opportunity for them to, to grow the, the model uh, and the footprint to go forward. If you are just joining us this evening, I'm in conversation with Grant Smear, CEO at Frankie Bell's Real Estate, looking at unused office buildings, some of the trends and, of course, the opportunities that are there. I can see the love coming through on our Facebook page. The usual suspects, Polina Nkosi, Alberta, uh, uh, Alberta Albertain coming through, Kosol Fumelo, Lindy Sichabela also coming through and checking in with us. And, of course, want to find out from you at home. I mean, what have been some of the uh, interesting conversions that you've seen? Uh, in especially in the metros because I know that a lot of us have now seen where there used to be an office block suddenly it's a it's a residential uh, you know uh, apartment block I've seen it quite a bit in in the Santin area and and we're seeing quite a lot of those so you're even having to change your your marker you know you used to say this was the 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 X company building and it's now no longer X company building uh, because it's been acquired and of course converted into something else. And Grant, I think on the issue of conversion, 
when you look at to convert or not to convert, because I think that also becomes the, the big thing, particularly with players who have the real estate uh, and had been primarily focusing on office or that part of their portfolio was office. What are some of the uh, factors that you need to look into when looking at whether to convert or not to convert? Um, and of course, the, the logistics that comes with that particular conversion. Yes, I mean, the first and foremost thing with property, and this is regardless of what type of property, is always a location. So what is the location of the property? Uh, who are your clients are that you're trying to service? And, and uh, how convenient is that property to, to what they require in terms of um, accessing amenities, accessing work, uh, traffic, uh, traffic flow, uh, schools, uh, anything that sort of they need on day to day or to, to live their lives, I suppose. Um, and then part two is the actual cost of conversion. Because not every single building is going to be uh, convertible. They're not going to be able to uh, change it into the space they necessarily need to. Uh, some uh, office buildings lack um, the ability to create uh, uh, or get natural light into rooms if you're going to create residential spaces. So I think the logistics and cost around converting some office blocks into um, into residential is probably the pro prohibitive thing. And I think when we also look at that, I mean, I, when I reflect on the black brick model, for instance, you 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 want to make sure that you have the right mix, right? On, on the one hand, you don't want to make it feel too hotel-y. So there certainly needs to be a certain sense of it feeling a bit like home. I think how do we best do that? I mean, I know that this is particularly big in, in Cape Town. I mean, in, in Joburg, it's yeah. not as big, but I know Cape Town has now become just massive. There's so many different players who are doing that work, play, live, uh, you know, kind of set up within uh, Cape Town because they know that some of us Joburgers will probably want to go down there, uh, perhaps take a month, maybe less or even more, and want all the amenities and certainly all the fixtures uh, in a property that feels like home and doesn't feel like I'm actually uh, working from a hotel. Yeah, so, so I mean, look, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I'm a massive fan of black brick models. In fact, I'm sitting in, in one of the rooms at the moment and I stand black brick when I'm here uh, in Joburg. And, and the reality here yeah, is, is that first, first, first thing that they've done very, very well is, is like you say, they've created amenities around uh, the lab workplace or the space. Um, but also what they've done is they've made very good use of the building. It's not uh, a hotel. Um, and, and I think what that does is create creates a bit of personality. And what I'm saying in is, is the first version of, of Black Brick, and it's a very industrial sort of look. But, it, but you know, every single room is different every time you stay here. It's interesting. It remains interesting, um, and, and it's just something that, that I really like coming back to every every single time. Quality-wise, um, you know, the, the, the fixtures, fittings, furniture is done very, very well. It feels like a home, it, uh, and they provide a kitchen space. You don't you don't go into a hotel where you can't cook, and you you know you can actually cook if you want to or go out uh, and have a meal. So I think. And just really given a lot of thoughts to to people who are traveling for work um you know and i, I think people who travel regularly like i do don't always want to have to go to a restaurant you want to feel like you're sort of sitting at home and have um, access to to do the things you normally do at home as a cook yourself um and, and feel very comfortable so again the blackwood models done very very well i've seen the the version two in Santa that they're doing i've seen that some of the show units there they've even made that a bit of a softer approach uh, much more well much less industrial much more homely um, and, and again, they, they do things very well. And so are some of the guys, and the Capital Hotel Group have done very well in that space as well, creating a hotel, but also residential spaces that people rent out, um, which also feel very, very much like you, you know, you stay at a home away from home. Mm. You, you know, Grant, I think one of the things when it comes to these conversions is getting a sense of whether the structure works or not. I mean, I, I and I won't name any names, I've been in somewhere, it didn't feel a, like home, but also you could just tell that this wasn't properly, you know, thought out. You know, I could still see the the remains of the office, so to speak. Uh, and so the either came across budgetary constraints or just a lack of imagination in terms of how to best approach uh, that particular conversion. Perhaps, to, you know, walk us through looking at whether 
a structure is in fact right for a conversion and would best be best place uh, for that kind of conversion. Because we also know that the, the capital, the costs of converting are quite high. Sometimes, in, you know, there have been instances I've looked at certain buildings where I've wanted to do conversions and you realize that, uh, and this isn't the unused one, so these are old buildings, and you realize that it would actually be cheaper for you to build from scratch than trying to build to um, the building you currently have and then obviously put your plumbing fixtures, your electrical fixtures in an apartment format. So how do we then handle that I almost want to say misplaced conversion uh, because there are a few, unfortunately, that are should should either have been done better or just shouldn't have been converted at all. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think um, you know again speaking about the, the sort of the two main ones that, that we know the capital and and black black brick. I think what they've done very very well. Is first thing is that I think they've done their budgets very well. They've done uh, focus on quality of fixtures and finishes. Um, and, and make sure everything sort of feels seamless. And, and I agree with you, where you go into spaces where they don't necessarily feel like uh, that's the case, it usually comes down to budget or shortcuts, um, you know, just straightforward shortcuts. And unfortunately, there are a lot of developers in the country, regardless of, of conversions or new builds, that do just um, uh, take shortcuts to try and get a building up, and you end up with, with loads of issues, be that electrical, um, you know, uh, damp, rise and damp, or, or water ingress, or, or, or worse in these conversions where, it, like you said, it doesn't feel like they've actually made the effort to, to convert it. So again, you know, when, when you are doing a conversion, it's it's less about um, looking at the building itself and making sure you've got the right experts in place to take the building that's in front of you and convert it into, into what you need to. So considering, again, um, you know, the floor structure of a, of a building, um, where windows are in particular for particularly you're going to go into the residential space. And then uh, the big one, which I think is missed in time, is just parking. I um, mean, you know, it's particularly in Java, you need parking and, mm. and sufficient parking to cater for, for people who be around. So, so there's a few elements here. Um, and, and what, again, you know, you look at the Black Brick model and what they've done very well is, is creation, creation of that community feel. So, you know, there's lots of events um, at, 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 the, um, at the hotel. Um, so the management of that hotel of the building itself is done very, very well. I am this evening in conversation with Grant Smear, CEO at Frankie Bell's Real Estate, looking at some of the opportunities and, of course, trends in unused office buildings and reflecting on some of the, the examples Grant has seen that have worked well, uh, some of the things that we have to bear in mind when you want to do uh, that conversion. And I think, Grant, and you've already started touching on this, perhaps take us through mistakes to avoid. Uh, and and I, I say this particularly to, I want to say, slightly smaller players because I've seen, you know, the, let's call them the slightly smaller players. So not your growth point or your black breaks, those, those would consider the bigger players who are seeing some of these opportunities and, you know, looking at potentially making it play. It may not be a very massive building, uh, but certainly starting relatively small. They've, you know, built up a bit of capital where they want to um, have a conversion. What mistakes should they avoid when you're looking at uh, acquiring, an, you know, an, an old office? building or a vacant office building and doing a conversion to a mixed use or a res an exclusively uh, residential building? Yes, I mean, uh, I think you actually touched on probably the biggest one, which is um, underestimating the cost of converting an existing building into what you sort of envision as a residential building um, or mixed use building. Uh, and, and again, you know, you buy, buy a building um, with, with so many underlying issues and you start the conversion. You know, I think um, anybody that's ever done a conversion on an older, older property um, realizes that you take the budget and sometimes you just double it because, you know, when you start uh, peeling back the layers, you start finding a lot of stuff that doesn't necessarily work, uh, infrastructure that you thought was working, that you touch it once and it, it falls apart and they have to replace everything. So um, I think the, the first first thing is the, the underestimation of the costs. And then part two is actually, and I've seen this happen a few times now, is overcapitalizing. The assumption that on uh, particularly in the short because because what these models rely on heavily is the short-term portion of the model so the uh, hotel room uh, the airbnb type uh, short-term lifting structure and what they do is they overestimate the pricing that they're going to be able to achieve um, and don't look at competitors in the area so try and put uh, you know make a, a seven-star building try and get seven-star rates when that's just not the market and it's a few particularly kept them that have fallen apart through the open capitalization and over assumption of, of pricing um, 
where, where it just it hasn't worked at all. And, and vacancies have been high and therefore the properties that are empty and the returns have been extremely low compared to the investment. Mm. And I think, you know, grant on that for, again, the players who uh, are looking to embark on this and really I almost want to say diversify their, you know, the business model and even their property portfolio. One of the key things, of course, is going to be um, capital and getting investors on board to, you know, to help with your uh, particular uh, project and with the conversion. You know, any tips for property entrepreneurs when it comes to communicating that to investors? Because I think that's one of the things we already know we're not always going to get money from the banks right i mean that's you're going to go there you're not always going to get uh the full amount sometimes you may not necessarily even go there because the nature of your deal may not land itself particularly well for that kind of financing so the moment you're looking at different investors to approach um how do you even position uh the particular property deal to prospective investors um, and what are some of the key fundamentals that you should always have when building a business case uh, for your investors? Yeah, so I mean, like I say, you know, uh, going to the space and, and this is just to uh, make the assumption that, that if you take the black book and dice down into an individual investor, you really look at the short-term investing model, um, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, the Airbnb model. Um, and I think I think the most important thing is when you approach investors, firstly, to have a test case um, running and uh, and you can take the, the, the black record of the, the capital uh, model and put it into uh, a one bedroom flat, for example, and make sure that you're renting out that one bedroom flat on a long term basis, achieving high frequencies because of the quality of the property. And you can then take that model and run it out and, and, and build it further and further. And once you've got that test case in place, uh, you can use that information to, to create your, your investment proposal and approach investors that are. I may may look to invest into that uh, into the property. So a few things on, on the investment side is you always always uh, you know show show uh, the the upside of the best case scenario, but also show the worst case scenario, and then offer the median, so offer the middle middle ground for the investor to make the informed decision. Uh, provide the investor with, with all all the allocation of the capitals, where is the capital going, and what is the area return going to be. The biggest biggest mistake I see in in property investment where you bring an investor in. Is the person actually doing the operations of this investment business? So the the uh, the newbie investor, or the investor themselves, is they never build in a portion uh, of income for themselves to the salary. So, so we take it from a company point of view. You've got your directors or your operational staff that get paid salaries, and then you get your shareholders, your investors, who then get returns on on or dividends or, or profit share. And the problem in in a, in a one-on-one scenario is that a lot of investors especially new guys, don't build in the, the cost of their time, the cost of their effort and energy um, as, a, as a salary into, into the model. And therefore, the, the returns look really, really high uh, for the investor because they haven't taken that cost out. But for the uh, newbie running around and, and, and doing all the work, um, the returns often don't seem like it's worth it. So you need to build in, in that little um, uh, salary, for lack of a better way to, to put it, um, for your time, effort and energy there. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got to approach several investors and, and um, um, always, always uh, highlight the, the downside, the risks, uh, but make sure that they realize that they could lose their capital, um, although you have a, a, a test case that you've proven um, through, through the model. Well, Grant, that's where we're going to leave it this evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. And that's Grant Smear, the CEO at Frankie Bell's Real Estate, wrapping up of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzamantongwa Kumalo. Well, we'll be back on your screens tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. as usual. And you can look forward to Ace of Classroom and the first time home buyer show at 8 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.